my project's about space junk, and me, Manuel, Cole, Jake, and Anderson, and Ben made this model. This is a spaceship collecting space junk and bring it to the truck, and that brings it to the recycling center. These are people playing chess, and they're not doing their work. So there's about 320,000 pieces of space junk orbiting around the Earth. And so now we have a new problem that um, a piece fell off and we put it back on, but it's making the ship um, going um, slower. So we um, are trying to find a way to fix it. I think this is an absolutely wonderful experience for the children because it's teaching them how to both sort of think very creatively and innovatively, but also very practically. And these are not the skills you get out of a book. You get this by doing. And this is the kind of learning that's priceless and it will stay with them for life. I just can't imagine. I'm overwhelmed by how amazing this whole thing has been and the whole experience leading up to it. sticks and tried to make like a shape of um, bridges and there's suspension and truss and um, um, arcs. The jello is made to look like water and the sweetest fish is fish for the water. The bridge, the bridge is made out of popsicle sticks and uh, glue and it's a truss bridge. We like originally did this for uh, our tech and design class and it's just a uh, drill-powered go-kart that we uh, saw in one of the uh, makers' like books. And it was like pretty fun to start building. It's me and my partner. She should be here soon. But uh, our original like design was just like way too bulky and like just air, like not. Good. It was like way too heavy to like be powered by just one drill. So like two weeks before today, uh, me and my teacher like decided to like rebuild like our whole design. And uh, he came up with like the original box frame and like the steering. And then throughout class, we just, uh, I added the, the back tires and the whole works here. I'm Henry LePage and my friend Jason and I built this bicycle generator. So how it works is if it was finished, there would be a platform right here that uh, holds the motor with a pulley and there would be a belt that goes around the pulley and the wheel to make electricity and the electricity would go from the generator right here to the diode so it would only go travel in the, so the electricity would only travel in one direction and it would go to the battery to hold the power and then after it went through there it would go to the resistor to, to like slow down the power a little bit so it would not blow up the capacitor and then it would go to, through the capacitor to make uh, to make enough energy for when like you turn on stuff that's plugged in, and then you and then it goes through the inverter because we're we're making DC power, but it needs AC power to work. And after it goes through the inverter, it goes to the kilowatt meter, which just shows how much power we've made. And then it goes to the power strip where you could just plug anything in, and then it goes to the TV and it works. We built this because we wanted to um, like have a little bit of a challenge, and I and we thought it would be cool if we could like make something to generate power without like a battery, just plugging anything into the wall. And we made the entire wood platform by designing it on a CAD program, and then we printed it out on a Shopbot, which was a grant from the Chappaqua School Foundation. So basically. Um we're using two thermoelectric generators. One of them is here, this, um, and the other is in the bottom of the cup on this one. And so what these generators do is they function off of two different principles, either the Seebeck effect or the Peltier effect. Um, this is demonstrating the Seebeck effect, which is that um, one, when one side of the generator is heated and the other side is cooled, then electricity is generated and it'll power this LED here. Um, and th this cup is demonstrating the Peltier effect, which is the opposite of the Seebeck effect. 
where it uses electricity, in this case it's a 9 volt battery, to generate elect to power the thermoelectric generator which heats up the liquid inside the cup. Originally we were trying to use the thermoelectric generators using body heat to create a phone charger or phone case to be able to power your phone on the go. However, pretty soon we learned that the thermoelectric generators actually require a lot of heat in order to function, about 300 degrees Celsius. So we uh, attempted to achieve that level of heat using the parabolic solar reflector. Now, the interesting thing about the shape of the parabola is that wherever light hits, it's always reflected back to a single point called the focal point. And at that focal point, it can get really hot. In commercial appliances, these can reach up to 400 degrees Celsius, which can be used to fry and cook foods. This also has a lot of applications in developing countries where it's a zero emissions way to cook food without the harmful effects of a wood fire. So we had an issue whenever um, we found out that the thermoelectric generators, they only function whenever there's a large heat differential. And so we had to try to figure out different ways that we could produce electricity and a large through large amounts of heat energy. Basically our major problem here that we had to work around was the fact that we weren't getting enough heat for the generator. Um, but also additionally I think finding the parts was just uh, kind of tricky. Uh, for the parabolic reflector we did need a satellite dish and you can find these in uh, just on the street. People throw them out but we were having a hard time acquiring the materials. Um, Finding a cooling system for our generator was also an issue, which is why it's not working right now. But overall, I think it was a really great problem-solving experience. So, basically what's going on in here, um, well, my project was using, um, using fruits and vegetables to make um, a battery to run thing. So that's my calculator, and it's run completely by um, all um, fruits and um, the electricity is coming from the lime. Basically what's happening is the atoms in the zinc are breaking up into zinc two plus and two electrons. The electrons are flowing into the copper, are going back into the solution and turning, um, meeting with H plus to form hydrogen gas. And that's basically how it works. So um, this is my project about lead in toys and water. And um, the real world problem here is that several people, children, or any, mainly anybody, have died from lead poisoning. And so what I did, I got water from Flint, Michigan, filtered water from a drinking fountain, and I decided to test it. And um, it came out negative, thank goodness. So DNA is a code of life. It's like a recipe for you. DNA stands for dioxyribonucleic acid. DNA is made out of four nucleotides. They are A, adenine, T, thymine, C, cytosine, and T, um, G, guanine. The backbone, this is the backbone that holds them together, is made out of sugar phosphate and dioxyribose. DNA has many functions, but one very well known one is how it makes proteins. The air that, that is made out of that is called protein synthesis. That's two steps. First step is transcription. Um, so DNA is found in the nucleus of a cell. The nucleus has makes partial copies of the DNA. Then that's that's much smaller. Has only one side and. It goes through, it's called RNA. The RNA travels through pores in the nucleus, goes to the ribosomes, which read the RNA, and that makes proteins. It's found in, DNA is found in the nucleus of a cell, but a small portion of it's also found in the mitochondria. So DNA makes you you, because first, your special DNA makes proteins that are special to you. Then, your special proteins are being formed in every cell in your body. And then your cells, which are supposed to be proteins, make your body parts that are unique to you. I am Aiden Leitch. I'm a freshman at Horace Greeley High School. And uh, today I have my 3D printer and a lot of things that I've made with it. Uh, so I have two 3D printers. Uh, one of them is not here, but this one I won in a competition. It came as a kit, built it came in a thousand different pieces but it works and I can make parts with it I can make almost any 
geometry out of plastic with it. So this thing right here, it's a functional object in that it can support a thousand pounds. Like you could step on this and it'll hold your weight no problem. Uh, this is a little universal joint. It's kind of like what they use in cars to uh, put the transmission to the tires. Um, this is a little piece that printed all as one piece. It's all made in one step. However, it's still flexible and can move. This is a compression spring. Printed all as one piece, but stretchy will like spring back to its original form. Now, I like to really experiment with the applications of 3D printing. For example, I'm experimenting a lot with soft robots. Soft robots are robotic structures made out of soft and compliant materials. This is made out of a silicon rubber, a very soft material, very flexible, I can squish it. However, uh, when it's inflated, it can do very special things. This one, when it inflates, it expands, except moves mostly in a vertical direction. And I can use other structures like this one, when I inflate it, it bends. The applications for technology like this, um, for example, grasping unusual objects. We cannot create a simple claw grabber for robots that will work on all objects. It's just not practical. Now, over here, the big star of the show that I brought today is a fully pneumatic robot arm. Unlike those which used air but were soft, this uses air and is hard. I have two pneumatic pistons and an air compressor and valves. Let me show you what it does. I'm Aiden Leitch and I like to make stuff. Thank you.